Welcome to Wicked Week here at Darkcast Network. I'm Amber, one of the hosts of the Weird True Crime podcast, and I'll be your host for this episode. If you are as creepy as we are here at Darkcast Network, you'll love this month as much as us. In fact, Spooky Month is pretty much year-round here. Today's episode is about Halloween traditions and some are downright weird. We thought it might be fun to listen to while you're getting your costumes on and readying yourself for that party, trick-or-treating, or passing out candy to the little ones knocking at your door. Let's hope none of those little ones are black-eyed children. And if they are, don't open your door. People love celebrating the spooky season by being frightened. We love walking through haunted houses or hayrides, watching horror films, and telling scary stories. Halloween is a time for getting the creeps. All in good fun, of course. What happens when you get more trick than treat? When a graphic decoration is liable to be deadly? At what point does a spooky celebration become a crime scene? I'm your host, Ash, and this is your host, Jordan. So let's get into it. Well, often a tasteless prank or cheap scare gone wrong is the reason for Halloween fatalities. And typically the person pulling the prank is the one who gets all tricks and no treats. Trigger warning, as this next section does get a little darker with accidental suicide and the death of multiple children as the subject matter. You ever see those houses with like fucking epic Halloween decorations out front? I see some people who put way too much shit out. Is that what you're talking about? (laughs) I think I actually remember (laughs) reading about this when it happened. In a small, quiet neighborhood, a man was discovered laying totally out in the open in what appeared to be a terrible accident with the garage door. The man laid with half his body sticking out from under the door, his blood speckled all over the door and driveway. Police had multiple calls in quick succession. There's a dead body in my neighbor's driveway. Help, come quick. Police sped to the scene, sirens screaming, lights flashing, ready to do the damn thing. Do the damn thing. Mm -hmm. Upon arriving, they discovered a much more sinister plot. Sinister plot. Mm. The owners had planted the body as a way to scare trick or treaters. Those dicks. This body was a prop. They had good decorations because I mean, everybody yeah. believed it. <laughs> you get them, guys. Y'all should have won a prize. They kind of did. They did get a lot of attention. Uh, the dummy, which had been made to appear like a person crushed by the door, was so convincing that people driving by were freaking out. And the emergency calls just kept pouring in. The cops were annoyed, but they also recognized the humor. I mean, let's be real. Like, what else is happening in They posted it on Facebook. They did. They did. They got on Facebook. They put an image of it. And they were like, this is a Halloween decoration. Do not call 911 reporting a dead body. They also replied to a few comments on the post saying they wanted to congratulate the owner on a great display. Usually you trust that there's like a distance between you and death. Actors, makeup, props. There's no chain on the chainsaw. You know? But what if there is? Bum, bum, bum. I was actually really surprised how often this one specific accident happens. I'm talking about imitating professional stunts without any real idea of what you're doing and definitely without proper safety training or fail safes in place. What typically happens is someone at a haunt or a neighborhood house looking to make a creepier vibe will show you a fake body hanging in a tree or one thing I've seen is like the body falls out of a tree or the gallows when you're going past. When it's done properly it you know the person is secured to a safety harness that's able to support their full weight. Why aren't they just using dummies in these? They're doing this to real people? Okay. The person's in a harness and, and this whole thing. So. There's all kinds of shit happening. Right right just to be clear yeah. So if done properly it gives you the creeps. It's a little jump scare onward into darkness. In 1990, 17 year old Brian Jewell was taking part in a haunted hayride in Lakeland, New Jersey. It was here he performed a stunt where he was hanging from the gallows. Brian had previously done this successfully many times throughout the month and even earlier that day. During the ride, about 40 people were driven past as they go through multiple creepy tableaus and frights. The trick was Brian would be standing on a crate, and as the customers were driven by on a tractor, he would step down to the ground to create the illusion he was hanging. He would then deliver a dramatic speech warning people to turn back and so on and so forth. The noose tied around his neck was not meant to tighten. The few times that day Brian had done it, it went without any incident. But on what was to be his final performance, Brian failed to deliver the speech he normally made as the wagon went past, which alerted the tractor driver that there may have been something amiss. Police said that the hayride patrons discovered Brian's body hanging from the gallows with his feet touching the ground. He was pronounced dead on the scene. They should have used a dummy. Even if you've done a stunt several times that day, every single performance 
performance, everything needs to be double checked. Yeah. You just can't be like, I've done it three times today. It's fine. You can advocate for yourself. If you're working at a, at a haunted hayride or something and they're like, hey, we're going to put you in a gallows. No, thank you. Yeah. How much are you paying me? Right. Yeah. So in the same year, William Anthony Odom of Charlotte, North Carolina, had created a haunted attraction in the basement of his aunt's house. In preparation for the evening, William was staging a gallows scene when the noose accidentally tightened, killing him. And sadly, that's all the information I can get. It's from the LA Times and 1990, man. That's really it, unfortunately. In October 2001 at Alpine Ridge Farms in Sparta, Michigan, 14-year-old Caleb Rafe was working a haunted hayride. Caleb felt awkward performing his specific job. He was meant to leap from the woods and scare people, you know, when they pass. Like, right. hey, man. He decided to take some initiative and swap places with another actor. Okay, yeah, sure. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, the okay. actor? Who was the actor, do you ask? I hmm, don't know. Well, a prop skeleton that was hanging by a noose in a nearby tree. So, yeah. Oh. Yeah. It wasn't even a person. Nope. He took a dummy down. Yeah. <laughs> we are not victim blaming no. a 14-year-old. Well, yeah, I'm going to have a wild guess. Nobody put any safety anything on No, the, uh, because it skeleton. wasn't meant for a person. No windpipe to crush. Caleb put the noose around his neck with his feet touching the ground, which in theory, I see what he was going for. But sadly, Caleb was not heavy enough to keep the branch from whipping back and choking him. Uh, Caleb began struggling to get the double knotted rope off of his neck, but his coworkers thought he was just acting. By the time they realized what was happening, efforts by patrons and employees to resuscitate him failed and Caleb was pronounced dead. Don't put ropes around your neck. Don't do it. Don't do mm-hmm. it. It's not a good idea. In twenty, in the year 2013. Oh. 16-year-old Jordan Moreland was decorating the front yard with his little sister. Jordan loved Halloween. It was his favorite holiday, and he really went all out on decorating. And according to his mom, he really had a passion for it. They'd been working hard all day, and after taking a break to help his mom with laundry, because he was a sweet little baby. Okay, because he was nice and yes, helpful. Jordan thought it would be fun to prank his sister, right? Okay. Yeah, a little bit of Halloween fun. So Jordan grabbed a noose decoration that he'd set up hanging in a tree, and he slid his neck inside. Waiting for his sister to pass, he would scare her and it would be really epic. But before he could do that, the rope tightened, cutting his brain off from oxygen within 20 to 30 seconds. Jordan's sister did find him, but he was unconscious. Their mother rushed out to cut him down and revive him to no avail. He was rushed to a hospital where Jordan had fallen into a coma. Although efforts were made to revive him, sadly, his organs had already began failing and he died just 12 hours later. Mm, What's going on next? Well, we're about to touch on two incidences of intentional suicide. On October 26, 2005, locals were haunted by a hyper-realistic Halloween decoration. (laughs) The decoration in question hung from a tree and a moderately busy road across from a neighborhood for several hours, suspended 15 feet from the ground. Since it was so high in the air and prominently displayed, hundreds of people saw it and... I bet they were super shocked later on to hear in the news that it was actually a real body. Oh, mm. I bet they were shocked. Yeah, dude, that would fuck with me. I'd be like, okay. Oh, shit, I saw that. It happened early in the morning, so people were like on their way to school uh, and like work and shit. That sucks. It's on a weekday. So the unnamed 42-year-old woman had hung herself, leaving her lifeless body on display for hours. Several neighbors said people saw the body around 7.30 a.m. Mayor William Glandon's wife, Faye, was quoted by a local paper saying, quote, They thought it was a Halloween decoration. It looked like something somebody would have rigged up. Authorities arrived at 11 a.m. to remove the body and process the scene. The unnamed woman lived about a quarter mile from where her body was discovered. So she kind of like tormented her fucking neighbors and like local community. In October 2009, 75-year-old Mustafa Mohamed Zaid was discovered on the third floor balcony of his home in Marina del Rey, California. Discovered slumped over a chair with a single gunshot wound to the eye. Neighbors had seen his body there for three days and thought it was a Halloween dummy. His body was in plain view of everyone in the apartment complex, but it was sort of unanimously decided that it was just a decoration. The LA County Sheriff's Department said the case was a, quote, apparent suicide and declined to comment any further. So, Who shoots herself in the eye? And it sounded really f- suspicious to That me. is suspicious. In 2014 in Spring Hill, Florida, Israel Lopez, 50, and Adam Hines, 36, were hired to clean out a rental home on Tree Haven Drive. The landlord had to evict the previous tenants who had skipped rent payments and left a huge stinky mess behind. They stank. The house was left looking like a bomb hit it. There were just 
boxes, paper, and shit everywhere. Dead mice were strewn all over the place, and there was just this foul, sour uh, smell everywhere. Of death? Because Maybe, of the uh, dead moth everywhere? Well, Ew. as the men moved into the garage, they discovered a strange object hanging from the ceiling. Property owners were positive it was a dark prank played by frustrated tenants or a distasteful Halloween decoration. Cutting the dummy from the ceiling, it was placed in a pickup truck along with piles of trash all headed for the city dump. When they arrived to the West Hernando Garbage Transfer Station, and here's where things get weird, county employees at the dump started noticing the load the men had dropped off. They <laughs> dropped a load. They dropped a load and it was stinkier than usual. That's literally what I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> the workers called the police and notified them that they were pretty sure a body had been dropped off. When Israel Lopez returned to the dump to drop off another load, he was recognized by workers and interrogated by police immediately. Well, the police determined that no crime had been committed by the workers, and the whole affair was just an honest mistake. Uh, but dude, that I'd probably quit my job. Yeah, once you realize you cut down a dead body hanging from a garage and then brought it to a dump with a bunch of trash well if you've been listening to these tales so far and you've been wondering how in the hell a body could be mistaken for a prop consider this quote from a witness i think it's important to realize that most people they either have seen someone who has very recently passed or they see them at a funeral home obviously this body was not anything close to either of those it was somewhat mummified well the neighbors said they hadn't seen anyone on the property for the past two months however one neighbor claimed to see a woman and two men at the house about 9 30 a.m who appeared to be showing the home to a potential renter and a few hours later she saw the pickup truck back into the driveway and the cleaners arrived took a while to notice him well a quick investigation revealed that Jeremy Allen Whitfirth, 33, had completed suicide by hanging in the garage several months prior. He's survived by a wife and two young children. I hate that all we can really share about these people is their final chapter, but really there's nothing else out there. Hello, I'm Jackie Moranti, and I'm the host and producer of Cause of Death 100 Seconds to Midnight, a Darkcast Network production. Tuberculosis. It's been known by many names. The Greeks called it thysis. The Romans called it tabes. In Hebrew, it was known as schleshapeth. Others called it the white plague. But most commonly, it was called consumption. In colonial New England during the late 18th and early 19th centuries, it was known as the vampire disease. It was during this time that tuberculosis killed more than 2% of the population of New England, and villagers were terrified. People watched as their relatives and friends lost weight and coughed blood while their skin turned gray. The disease would progress day by day and month by month until the patient finally passed away. People with tuberculosis seemed to wither away as if, well, as if something was feeding on them. Tuberculosis is highly contagious, and it wasn't uncommon for entire families to succumb to the disease. Families watched as their brothers, sisters, fathers, and mothers were consumed by it. They wondered if they would be next. This was before germ theory and a knowledge of bacterial infections. So physicians and families turned to the only thing they knew, superstition. They began to believe that their villages were under attack by vampires. They believed that their relatives had just joined the ranks of the undead. Near what is now Griswold, Connecticut, lay the village of Jewett City. The people of Jewett City were prepared to fight vampires and rid their community of the undead. They dug up the graves of people who had died of tuberculosis, and if there was nothing but a skeleton left, they would decide whether the deceased was a vampire. If the village believed that the person was not a vampire, they would turn them face down, just in case. After a thorough examination of the bones and a decision was made that the corpse had turned into a vampire before death, they would rearrange the bones by decapitating the skeleton. They would then remove the legs so that the vampire couldn't walk out of the grave. 
Many times the bones would be arranged in a skull and crossbones pattern to confuse the vampire and prevent them from putting themselves back together. If the corpse had not decomposed and the organs remained, the villagers would often burn the heart and the liver to prevent the body from rising from the dead to feed off more people. The ashes of the burned organs were sometimes fed to those who were ill with tuberculosis in an effort to cure them. These were desperate times, and the constant threat of death loomed over them, making them do desperate things. Let's just say that their hearts were in the right place until they were thought to be vampires. If you'd like to hear more of this story, my Halloween episode is all about demons and disease this year. Join me at Cause of Death 100 Seconds to Midnight. I'd like to thank the DarkCast Network for allowing me to tell this story. And to all of you, remember that it's illegal to dig up your relatives, even if you believe they're vampires. Happy Halloween. Hey everybody, welcome to Sinister Story Hour. My name is Steph. For some of us, we wait the entire year for October to get here. The fall colors, the activities, hay rides, the pumpkin spice, everything. For me, it's about getting home after a long day at work and cuddling in my fuzzy blankie and watching scary movies. The whole vibe is incredible. Some people love Halloween, they love the candy, the trick-or-treating. For others, it's about dressing up. Dressing up as something you wouldn't normally be. Let's face it, Halloween costumes have come so far. There are so many different things you can be. Funny, sexy, silly, spooky, whatever you want. You name it. But Halloween costumes in the first part of the 1900s were terrifying. Most were based on the fears of Christian beliefs or death, and people would dress a lot of the time like demons, witches, Satan, the LGBTQ, (laughs) just kidding about that last one, kind of. Halloween costumes, though, if you think about it, have come so far. The origin of Halloween costumes, however, may actually date over 2,000 years, starting back with the Celtic pagan festival of Samhain which would mark summer's end and the beginning of the year's darker half in the British Isles and started on October 31st and it continued through. During the festival, people believed that the ghosts of the world would become visible to humans. Some people would offer treats and goodies to the gods while others would dress in costumes like animal skins and animal heads so that wandering spirits didn't confuse them as one of their own. Now, there's really been no written documentation of those practices, because the Celts really passed down the stories of their tradition orally throughout the generations. The English word Halloween actually derives from All Hallows' Eve, because it's the evening before the Christian Holy Day on November 1st that's known as All Saints' Day. November 2nd is known as All Souls Day. The 11th century is when Christians adapted the Halloween holiday on October 31st. Bet you didn't think you'd be getting a semantics lesson while you were listening, did you? When Irish and Scottish people migrated to America in the 18th century, they brought their Halloween superstitions, traditions, and costumes with them. Americans really embraced the traditions and the dark-rooted spirit in which it came, especially the costumes. We love costumes, still to this day. Early Americans made their costumes at home by using sheets, makeup, and rigging up their own masks. The idea was to look as anonymous as possible. By the 1920s and 30s, people were starting to have Halloween parties, dances, and masquerade balls, for both adults and children. Sometimes their costume preparation would begin as early as August, which sounds a lot like my house, with my nine-year-old beginning as early as May, June sometimes. Incidentally, around this time, the Great Depression had reared its ugly head and hundreds of male teens would disguise themselves on Halloween and blow off steam by rolling cars over and cutting down telephone poles thus the trick part of trick-or-treat. 
After the Great Depression, marketers began to really capitalize on selling costumes. Cartoon characters like Popeye became extremely popular around that time. People also became fascinated with portraying characters on the fringes of society, such as hobos, pirates, gypsies. During World War II, adults stopped really dressing up for Halloween. In the 1960s, superhero costumes were big, and adults started dressing up again, opting more for costumes where their face could be seen. But as we know, there's always a place for scary outfits. When a rash of horror flicks hit in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, characters from those movies were suddenly the big new popular costume. Freddy Krueger, Jason, and Michael Myers were the favorites back then, and to be honest, you still see them every year now. So I would love to know what kind of Halloween costume you love. Will you be a vampire, a sexy winch, an ogre? Let's face it, you can make any costume a sexy costume, which I've never been the sexy Halloween costume kind of girl. I would love to see your Halloween costumes. Make sure to share those with me on my social media at Sinister Story Hour on Instagram or Sinister Hour on Twitter. Uh, X, formerly known as Twitter. Thank you all for listening. Happy Halloween! Oh, Halloween. We have spooky skeletons, ghostly encounters, scary and fun costumes, trick-or-treating if you're a cool kid, and of course, like most of us who celebrate Halloween, you probably have carved a pumpkin this month. Maybe even painted one like I did this year. Well, my spooky friend, I am Keely, the host of Missy Mysteries Podcast. It's a podcast that covers both true crime and paranormal topics, focusing on historical and unsolved crimes. And today, on the day of Halloween, or All Hallows' Eve, I'm going to be telling you about the old Irish tale of Stingy Jack, the origins of our pumpkin carving traditions. You see, Stingy Jack was a man with a certain reputation. He was an old blacksmith who always had a little bit too much to drink. Jack was described as two-faced and always involved in some sort of deceitful scheme. Jack thrived on manipulating others, always playing tricks on anyone he could. He was simply a selfish person. The devil hearing about a man like Stingy Jack took a great interest and he wanted to meet the man for himself. One day during a dark and cold night on rural land in Ireland, the devil set up a trap for Stingy Jack. The devil sent a demon Jack's way that posed as a dead body. When Jack ran into this dead body, the eyes became wide and the face of the dead person became deranged, accompanied by an evil grin just for Jack. Jack immediately knew his time was up and that the devil had sent a demon to collect his soul. Jack, being the man he was, begged this demon for a final request before his demise. He wanted to have a drink with the devil. His final wish granted, Jack sat at a nearby tavern with the devil having a drink. Well, between the two of them, one drink turned into another and turned into another, eventually leaving the tavern with nothing else to serve them. When time came to settle their tab for the night, Jack was penniless, shocking. So he came up with a brilliant plan. Knowing the devil had magical powers and could transform himself he convinced the devil to turn himself into a piece of silver that he could pay the tab with. The devil thought this was a great plan, but when the devil turned himself into a piece of silver, instead of paying the tab, being the stingy, manipulating man he was, Jack shoved the devil in his new silver shape into his pocket. Knowing now that he had been double-crossed, the devil attempted to fight this and get out of Jack's pocket. Despite his fighting, Jack had trapped the devil in his pocket with a crucifix, and the only way out was to make a deal with stingy Jack, the two-faced man. Jack's deal with the devil was the devil was to leave Jack alone for a year, and Jack would let him out of his pocket. 
Taking this deal, the devil had a year before he could try to collect Jack's soul, and Jack had a year to figure out his next trick. A year rolled around, and the devil was back for Jack's soul. However, Jack had a different trick up his sleeve. Jack asked the devil if he could help him get rid of his hunger for the long journey he was about to take by helping him get an apple from a nearby tree. When the devil climbed up the tree to pick an apple, Jack took the opportunity to carve four crucifixes into the bark of the tree, trapping the devil again. The devil trapped again was angry with Jack, telling him to let him down. But Jack only let him down from the tree given that the devil would leave him alone for 10 years. The devil agreed to this deal, and Jack, happy to have his 10 years, let the devil down where they went separate ways. In his 10 years he got from trapping the devil, Jack's years of alcoholism eventually caught up with him. Jack escaped the devil with his tricks, but he couldn't trick death for more time. When Jack's time on earth was up, he found himself face to face with St. Peter at Heaven's Gates. Given the man he was in life, Jack was sent down to hell to face the devil who he had tricked one too many times. As he headed to hell, the devil was waiting to finally get his revenge on Jack. When he got to hell, the devil told him, hit the road. You didn't want to be here before and you aren't welcomed now. Denied by both heaven and hell, Jack was left to wander the darkness, although the devil did grant him one last kindness before he left. Jack asked for an ember for a little bit of light to guide his way in the darkness. The devil picked up a small, red-hot coal and gave it to Jack to carry his small ember. While Jack wandered the darkness with his small ember, he found a turnip and hollowed it out. He placed the ember in the hollowed turnip to create a makeshift lantern to guide his way. Since he was denied entry to both heaven and hell, Jack's ghost is seen wandering the Irish countryside. When locals see Jack's ghost and his turn up lantern, they say, oh, it's just Jack O the Lantern or Jack O'Lantern. As we know, October 31st, it's Halloween and many other celebrations happen on this day as well. Among these celebrations and beliefs, it's generally believed the veil between the spiritual world and ours is open, attracting spirits to the living. For the Irish locals, 31st made them worried spirits may try to enter their homes, including Jack's spirit, who was forced to wander the darkness with his lantern. They would carve menacing faces into turnips and rutabagas and displayed them on their doorsteps, with candles inside, just like Jack's lantern, in hopes to keep Jack and other spirits wandering on Halloween night away. Now, as we know, America is a melting pot and many of our traditions come from different cultures and places. While in the 19th and 20th century, the tradition of carving turnips and rutabagas was brought over by Irish immigrants, but it was quickly realized that a gourd more indigenous to America was bigger and easier to carve. That gourd is of course the lovely pumpkin. So. From the story of Stingy Jack, the tradition of the jack-o'-lantern and carving pumpkins was born. Before I leave you to hear all the traditions from all the other amazing dark cast shows, I want to remind you not to add any chemicals to your jack-o'-lanterns for the wildlife that may find your spooky porch friend tasty. And a great way to help prevent the pollution added to the landfill from pumpkin carving each year is to make sure to add your jack-o'-lantern to a compost pile or look into farms that may use your jack-o'-lantern to help naturally deworm and feed many of their farm animals. Till next time, I hope you have a very spooky but safe Halloween. My name is Brenda, and I'm the creator and host of the podcast Horrifying History. Are you into the dark side of history? Horrifying History tells you about the side of history that people don't normally talk about. We tell the tales of haunted places, infamous true crimes, the paranormal, unsolved mysteries, and then we look to history to see where the truth actually lies. Today, we're going to tell you where the lore behind poisoned Halloween candy comes from. Now, as you all know, monsters and goblins pop out of the woodwork at Halloween. But if you were to believe Buffy the Vampire Slayer, 
Halloween is when the monsters take the day off. That brings an opportunity for real-life monsters to come out and play. And this happened in Deer Park, Texas, on a dark and rainy Halloween night in 1974. On that night, optician Ronald Clark O'Brien was out watching his kids as they were trick-or-treating in a neighborhood near their home. Eight-year-old Timothy and five-year-old Elizabeth were joined by their neighbors, Jim Bates and his young son, as they went on the hunt for free candy. The group approached a house that had its lights off, but the kids knocked on the door anyhow. After all, the hope of getting more candy was just too hard to pass up. No one came to the door, so the disappointed kids left to find the next house to hit up. Jim followed them, but Ronald, he stayed behind. A short time later, Ronald caught up with the group and said he had some great news. He pulled out a handful of 21-inch or 53.34 centimeter long pixie sticks. For those of you who have not indulged in a pixie stick, it's a colored powdered candy that's packaged in a wrapper that makes it look like a big drinking straw. You pull the end off and pour the powdered candy directly into your mouth. They come in various flavors and basically it's eating straight sugar with either a sweet or a tart taste. It's every kid's dream sugar rush, but back to our story. So Ronald, he pulled out these pixie sticks and he told the group that there actually was somebody at that last house after all. They gave him the pixie sticks, one for each of the children to enjoy. Ronald passed out the treats. He gave an additional one to Jim for his child who wasn't there that night, and another one he gave to a 10-year-old boy that Ronald saw trick-or-treating. The boy was from Ronald's church, and the group saw them as they were returning back home. After getting home, Ronald told his kids to get ready for bed, but before they did, the kids were allowed to have one treat from their night's hall. Ronald's son Timothy chose the pixie stick. As he opened it, he found that the powdered sugar was stuck in the straw. He asked his dad for help, and Ronald manipulated the tube to dislodge the treat inside. Then Timothy took his first hit of sugar, and it tasted bad. Timothy told his dad that it tasted really bitter, so Ronald gave him a glass of Kool-Aid to wash away that bitter taste. Less than an hour later, Timothy was dead. A phone call was made to the Pasadena Police Department that same night, saying that an eight-year-old boy had died. He was rushed to the hospital, but there, there was nothing they could do. The police went to the hospital and then contacted the nearby medical examiner of Harris County to inform them of this situation. The medical examiner then asked the officer, what did the child's breath smell like? A quick call to the morgue revealed that there was a scent of almonds coming from the boy's mouth. Now, if you all have been paying attention when you listen to true crime podcasts, cyanide smells like almonds. An autopsy was performed and it showed that Timothy ingested enough cyanide to kill two fully grown adults. Tests also proved that the top two inches of the pixie stick that Timothy ate was packed with cyanide. Timothy was murdered. The police were able to recover the candy from the other kids in the group before they were able to dig into them. But the scary thing was that the police saved another child's life that night. The police had discovered that the tampered pixie sticks were sealed with staples. When the police arrived at one of the houses that night, one of the children in the group was in bed with his pixie sticks in hand. The only reason he didn't eat it was that he wasn't strong enough to get the staple to come out. The police then asked Ronald to bring them to the neighborhood that they were trick-or-treating in and wanted him to direct them to the house where he got those pixie sticks. But when they got to the neighborhood, Ronald allegedly forgot which house they went to. He also claimed that he never saw the face of the person responsible. The person who gave him the pixie sticks had just emerged from a shadowy doorway and handed him the candy. So I can guess that you all are thinking the same thing that the police were that that comment was very suspicious. So the police brought him out again and they were very direct with him. Show us which house. Now immediately, Ronald just happened to remember and pointed at a house. Conveniently for Ronald, the house owner was not home at the time. The police were able to track the man down at his place of work and they immediately arrested the man. But there was a problem. The man had an alibi. 
he was at work the night in question, and this was witnessed by many people. The man's wife and daughter were also home that night, but they ran out of candy. They turned off the lights and they did not answer the door. At this point, detectives were told that Ronald's current behavior was very strange. Now apparently, he was mad that his relatives did not stay up late the night of Timothy's funeral. According to Ronald's family, Ronald said that he wrote a song about Jesus and how Timothy joined him in heaven. Ronald got mad when his grieving family did not want to stay up late to watch a recording of this song being performed on television. And that's not all. Detectives also discovered that Ronald had very recently taken out life insurance policies on his kids. $10,000 per child, and a month before Halloween, he added an additional $20,000 on each child. At this point, investigators discovered that Ronald had debts over $100,000, so they called the insurance company. This is when they discovered that Ronald had called the insurance company at 9 a.m. the day after Timothy died, demanding to be paid out. The police immediately went to a judge to get a search warrant. What they found was a pair of scissors that had blades. These blades had plastic residue on them that was the same as the plastic containers of the contaminated pixie sticks. Ronald was arrested and brought in for questioning. Now during questioning, even further evidence came out. Ronald was going to a local community college, and in class he asked his professor odd questions like, what is more lethal, cyanide or some other type of poison? Another individual who worked for a chemical company told police that a man came in to buy cyanide, but he left after he was told the smallest quantity he could purchase was five pounds. He didn't remember what the guy looked like, but he said that the man was wearing a smock like a doctor. Now, if you all remember, Ronald was an optician. He would wear a smock as part of his work uniform. But these were the days before DNA testing and debit cards. Because of this, police could not 100% prove that Ronald killed his own son and tried to kill the other children that Halloween night. Ronald pled not guilty at trial, and his defense attorneys tried to blame some sort of Halloween boogeyman who used the cover of Halloween to murder children. But that defense didn't work. It took the jury only 46 minutes to return a guilty verdict for the person who the press were now calling the Candyman. An hour after that, it was decided that Ronald would meet his end in the electric chair. And now, my spooky friends, you know the tale behind the urban myth that still floats around today. That evil people are handing out treats filled with broken glass, poison, or sometimes razor blades, even though there is not much evidence to suggest that this is a thing. But I didn't say it doesn't happen. In the year of 2000, a man was charged with putting needles in snicker bars that he handed out to trick-or-treaters. One teen suffered from a slight needle prick, but to date, there hasn't been another case where a child died after eating contaminated treats. So what happened to Ronald? He never saw the electric chair because the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the electric chair was cruel punishment. So on March 31, 1984, Ronald died by lethal injection. So my spooky friends, the moral of this story is just be safe. Check your children's candy just in case. Thank you all for joining me today to hear the real story behind the lore of poisoned Halloween candy. If you want to hear even more tales like this, you can subscribe to Horrifying History wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And to get even more spooky content, join us on Facebook at Horrifying History, on Instagram and threads at Horrifying underscore History, or on Twitter at Horrifying H-I-S-T-1. Thank you for joining us for Darkcast Network's Wicked Week. We had a great time presenting all kinds of scary for your listening pleasure this week. Be sure to take a few minutes to check out all of the incredible Darkcast Network shows by visiting darkcastnetwork.com. Be careful though, you just might get hooked on a new favorite. Once again, this was Amber of Weird True Crime, and from all of us at Darkcast Network, we wish you and yours a very safe and happy Halloween.